More than one year ago, we started with the ambition to develop a reusable liquid rocket engine with an amount of power not seen in the Netherlands in over 75 years. It was immediately obvious to us, as it was to anyone really, that we were in for a challenge, which was exactly what we were looking for. We spent the first months of our project um, trying to find out what these challenges exactly were. We talked to industry leaders, professors at the TU Delft, and all their alumni, and they made one thing very clear to us. That hot firing a, a liquid rocket engine within one year would be very difficult, if not impossible. And well, for the following reasons. We had mere months to design, build, and test the entire system from tanks all the way up to the uh, combustion chamber, and we had to do it all from, without, from within our dorm rooms due, due to the corona. Secondly, traditionally, rocket engine design costs millions of euros. We would be lucky to acquire a fraction of a fraction of that. Suppose you actually overcome these two challenges. Suppose you actually manage to build it. Then we would still have to find a place somewhere in the Netherlands, a country not very well known for its space industry, to actually test this powerful engine. A challenge indeed. And yet, here we proudly stand. I am Lex Lubbers, the partnership manager at Project Sparrow, and I am more than ecstatic to welcome you all here today in the aula and some of you online. Today we will be presenting the first year of Project Sparrow in hindsight. We will start at the beginning with the goals we set for ourselves and the motivation behind them. We will explain our design choices that we made to accomplish these goals and the challenges that arose from them. Of course, at the end of the day, we will also show you what it all resulted in. Besides our own story, we will also have a presentation from an old DARE member, COO and co-founder of Don Aerospace, Tobias Knop. He will share with you what a startup company that originated from DARE is able to do in the European space industry by redefining access to space. For now, let's start with the goals of Project Sparrow. And for that, I would like to give the word to our team manager, Francesca. I would like to start in May of 2020, when a new group of full-time engineers came together to think about what we're going to do this year. You have to imagine a bunch of engineers who, have, who are very interested in rocketry, but have very different levels uh, of understanding uh, about it. So we decided uh, to go and ask ourselves three questions. Question number one was why? Why are we here? Why are we doing this project for an entire year? We're here because we are students who are motivated to reach for space. And in the process of doing so, we would like to also democratize it. The next question is how? How do we actually do this? A lot of companies, space companies, they have grown to have a lot of resources to be actually be able to make it to space. But obviously, we don't really have those resources. So we're here to show you how we can do it with less. Finally, the biggest and most important question is what are we actually going to do to show this? So let me paint the scene for you a little bit. Uh, we had, we were essentially, we thought we were at the end of a pandemic. It turns out we were somewhere in the middle of the pandemic, so the future was looking pretty gloomy. Uh, a lot of time at home in our home offices. There was a big uh, project called Stratos 4, also part of DARE, that was planning on launching in the next year. So that era was also coming to an end. It was time for us to decide on something new to de design, build, and test. As any good uh, engineer would, we sat together and we brainstormed everything that we could possibly think of. These ideas range from actually building and launching a rocket, but also building hoppers, or maybe even a lunar lander. So it was quite diverse, and there were some quite out there crazy ideas as well. We realized that uh, we had to come up with something very uh, realistic so that we could actually see what we could do this year. So we decided to start small. Starting small meant for us that we were going to try and build a liquid rocket engine uh, that would be thrust vector controllable. From here, 
we came up with our mission statement uh, that reads, develop a technology demonstrator for an orbital rocket engine. We wanted to show that we can actually develop a technology of a cryogenic liquid rocket engine within a year uh, and demonstrate uh, thrust vector control. To tell you a little bit more about what we actually designed, uh, I would like to now hand over to our chief engineer from this year, Luca Martorelli. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. We have people here today from all different backgrounds, which might not all include rocket engines. So uh, we will try to start with a short crash course about our system in order to explain you what we worked on uh, for the entire year. So I would like to welcome everyone to the lecture Firebolt Engine 101. Generally speaking, uh, a rocket engine works by expelling uh, mass at very high velocity. In, in this case, exhaust gases. To give an idea of how fast this mass is expelled by an engine, um, you can consider that our, our engine, uh, a firing from our engine of 40 seconds, will expel around 250 kilograms of propellants in order to generate around 15 kilonewton of thrust. The major components of any uh, liquid rocket engines are propellant, tanks, a feed system, um, and a thruster. Propellants are what actually um, is expelled by the engine, as I said, and generate thrust. For the Firebolt engine, uh, we use ethanol diluted at 80% as a, as a fuel and uh, liquid oxygen as oxidizer. Uh, obviously, in this picture, you can't visualize them uh, since the aforementioned propellants are stored in the tanks. These are two big tubes uh, designed in order to fit the proper amount of volume, in this case around 80 liters per tube, uh, and in order there to withstand uh, uh, pressures up to 75 bar and very low temperatures. In fact, uh, you can consider that the uh, oxidizer tank have to, have to survive to temperatures um, around minus 100 deg degrees Celsius uh, um, due to the cryogenic nature of the liquid oxygen. Next, we have the feed system. The feed system has two main functions, deliver the propellant from the tank to the thruster and to pressurize it. There are many, many ways to pressurize your propellant. Uh, in our case, we use a pressure-fed regulated system. This means that we use uh, in here around 600 liters of high pressure nitrogen in order to pressurize our tanks and thus the entire system. Um, but the feed system also, it's also formed by a very complicated uh, uh, network of flex hoses, pipes, uh, endless fittings, uh, and around 20 valves. Um, this has to handle around uh, three liters per second uh, of propellant per side. To give an idea, more or less, of how much this is, uh, you can consider that uh, this is around 100 times what a Formula One car consumes. And we are only speaking about one of the two sides of the engine. Finally, uh, we have the, the thrust chamber, what is called the thrust chamber. Um, it refers to the combination of combustion chamber and nozzle. The nozzle has a shape that is optimized in order to accelerate the exhaust gases produced in the combustion chamber um, to far, far more than um, the velocity of sounds in order of using thrust in the most efficient way. As you can imagine, the exhaust gases produced in the combustion chamber are quite hot. <laughs> we, are, we are speaking about temperatures around 3,000, 3,300 Kelvin. Uh, this means that we had to find a way uh, for preventing our engine from melting down. So we implemented regenerative cooling. You can see here in the, in the combustion chamber and in the nozzle those tiny uh, chain channels. Those are used in order to run uh, the fuel uh, in the wall of the chamber in order to keep, it, to keep it cool. And they go from the exit of the nozzle all the way uh, till the enter of the combustion chamber. But at some point during the year, we realized this was not enough. So we also implemented film cooling uh, just before the throat. 
Uh, this is a technology that allows us to uh, inject a thin layer of, of fuel just in the section, in the most critical section of the engine, in order to protect, at least from a thermal point of view, uh, the wall and uh, uh, to reduce heat transfer. Now, um, our beautiful uh, engine is, is manufactured using 3D printing. You may wonder why are you using 3D printing for, for that. As you may have already got, uh, this, our, our engine has a very complicated shape with exactly 72 channels running through the walls and with walls as thin as a fingernail. Um, it also has to withstand uh, very high pressures uh, and uh, extreme temperatures, as I said. So, as you can imagine, uh, manufacture something like that with conventional uh, manufacturing method, um, it's not very easy. Uh, in this, 3D printed uh, allowed us to overcome all these challenges. Um, and hence, our engine is 3D printed with Inconel, that is a nickel-based super alloy uh, that is very resistant also at high temperatures. And this allowed us to, as I said, overcome, overcome also all, this, all our challenges and fit perfectly our application. So, um, as you may imagine, uh, designing and building a rocket engine is not easy, but what most of the people don't know is that successfully igniting one uh, it's, can be uh, also harder than that. So, this year we decided uh, to actually, at least for the first tests, uh, to use a simplified version uh, of, our, of our engine in order to validate the ignition system and timing. Uh, this you can see here uh, in the slide uh, is what we call our battleship chamber. This has been used uh, during all our first test campaigns and allowed us to actually test more often and uh, to avoid a big loss of resources in case of test failure. So now you have a bit of a better idea of how our system looks like, but we forgot one subsystem of utmost importance in order to achieve our mission statement. In fact, if you want to go orbital, somewhere in the far future probably, um, you definitely need a transvector control system. This is a way of uh, actively control your rocket in order to stabilize it and in order to get into the right orbit at the right spot. Our Trust vector control system features uh, two big actuators. You can see here are the black ones <laughs> that allows the engine uh, to move just enough uh, to, as I said, to control the rocket as much as you need. Um, but apart from that, there is also a structure called gimbal that connects actually here in the slide uh, the, the engine to the vertical blue plate that is the trust bench. Um, that that is the actual structural part that connects the rocket engine to the rocket and allows all the force generated by the rocket engine to be transmitted to the rocket without preventing it from moving. Um, but truss vector control is not only that. Uh, there is a lot of electronic works uh, involved in order to make the, the actuators move and there is a lot of control theory in order to ensure that the movement that the actuators have to perform and then the engine have to perform are the right one at the right time. So, uh, to conclude, as you can imagine, uh, uh, some, summing up, uh, one year, one full year of work uh, performed by 40 students in around six minutes, <laughs> it's quite impossible. Uh, but I hope with this crash course I gave you a glimpse of uh, the work we performed this year of our final system and the complexity of it. In two words, the Firebolt engine. Thank you, Luca, and congratulations to everybody in the audience for passing your first course on rocket engineering. We will now take a quick break from student rocket engineering and have a look at what a startup is able to achieve in the Euro European space industry by redefining access to space. Please welcome to the stage, COO and co-founder of DARE, Tobias Knop. Uh, Don, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> also there. Thanks, Lex. Um, not co-founder of DARE, co-founder of Dawn Aerospace, but I, well, I'll excuse the slip of the tongue, I'm not that old. Um, I will be talking a little bit about uh, Dawn Aerospace, but actually what I will focus on mostly and what I was most excited about when Lex reached out to me is that the, the stage that you are all at, specifically speaking at the Project Sparrow members right now, really reminded me of where 
I was eight years ago with my sort of fellow students back then that you can see on the picture here, um, which like most of these now form integral parts of, of Dawn Aerospace. So um, I'll, I'll go a little bit into Dawn Aerospace, but I really want to talk about the story and hopefully leave you with a bit of an, bit of an idea of what can happen if you not only look at a one-year time frame, but let's say a, a 10-year time frame. So a little bit about, uh, about Dawn Aerospace. Dawn Aerospace was founded uh, five years ago, and as I mentioned, with a group of uh, former um, students and uh, fellow students of mine about five years ago. We right now have two offices in Christchurch, New Zealand, and uh, here in Delft. And we've been pretty rapidly growing in this time. We're now at 45 uh, FTE, plus you know some, some extra hands here and there, and uh, interns supervising some thesis projects, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and most importantly, we've been uh, very successful in actually deploying our technology into space. So we are primarily um, a space transportation or space mobility company. And uh, the most important products that we already sell are thrusters that made it onto, um, 50, well, there are 15 different units which already made it to space. And there's a three-digit number lined up for the next 18 months. So that's really, really exciting for us that we actually managed to make the jump from uh, being a student student team, if you will, to, uh, to a company. But as I said, that's enough uh, about Dawn for now. I'll talk a little bit more about our uh, Moonshot project, our, our rocket-powered space plane to go to space twice in a day later on. Uh, but for now, I really was um, thrown back when I saw how, how Project Sparrow came together to when we started, which was in, in uh, about 2011, when much like the liquid oxygen or the, the cryogenic rocket engine project that uh, Project Sparrow works on, we were working on a, uh, a hybrid rocket engine, which is a different technology. But what they have in common is that at the time, it was something novel that hadn't really been done before within there. It is something that um, a lot of people thought, ah, oh, is it really worth the effort? We, have, we already have some old technology that works. It's not quite as good, but, you know, start, start playing, but, you know, there's likely not much coming from it. But regardless, we tried anyway. It took one year of preparation, and we achieved, uh, well, you can look what looks a little bit like a, like a steam engine, but really is a, our first attempt at a rocket engine, which lasted about three seconds and then fell into its bits. Um, but we kept at it, not to be discouraged by this, um, went on to static tests, which already, already looked a lot more uh, promising, and ultimately wrapped all of this into a vehicle that we flew in 2013, uh, and 2012, actually. I, you know. Um, and at the time when I said everybody was sort of belittling this and thinking, ah, it's, you know, this new technology, nobody's, you know, it, it, it won't amount to much. In fact, uh, after this uh, demonstration, we actually started scaling this up because it um, turned out that by the time we were definitely having so much momentum that we were the most in-depth developed rocket technology at the time, let's say a 2013 time frame, and we were the, well, prime candidate to uh, provide the propulsion system for what was back then the flagship project of DARE, Stratos 2. The older members or older people in the audience might remember this. Um, and in fact, the, what was previously considered the baseline design and the safe bet started crumbling a bit, and we were with our back then very new technology suddenly the, um, well, car carrying this, uh, this project forward. And specifically, this picture on the left struck me because uh, I had, um, w when, I, when I saw that um, uh, test activities for Sparrow were gearing up, I was really sort of moved back in time to this moment where you see me on the left in the white lab coat, where we were sitting in this bunker looking at a small screen, hoping that everything would go well. And I was really, um, I, I really rooted for everybody that was, uh, well, I'm sure you remember how it felt when you were there. Um, and of course, the, the, the excitement of you know, pushing the button and seeing everything that you've worked so hard for work. Um, and um, most importantly, also, as you, you know, see on the right, sometimes stuff doesn't quite work. But the thing is really that if you stay on it, you, you keep moving forward, you overcome your failures, that's, that's, that's all that matters. And uh, well, I can tell you there were a lot more of those pictures on the right than they were the pictures that were in the middle. So it really took a lot of... Uh, overcoming in that sense. Um, but ultimately we did, and we wrapped everything again into a vehicle, and um, we put together the rocket, went to Spain, pushed the button, and the rocket did not fly anywhere. It, in fact, remained quite static on the launch pad for reasons that I won't go into, but let's say it was a design, design flaw. 
But so far, really the biggest setback, we had a team of around about 30, 35 people. We went to Spain for two weeks. We set everything up. And in the end, we packed the rocket back into a box and went back home, which was very, very disappointing. But really, again, we looked at the data. We looked at everything. Um, we figured out what went, what went wrong. We got the team back together. And ultimately, um, we made the rocket fly and, uh, well, took this picture on the right one year later. That was in 2015. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is that, in general, when you, when you have a project, there's always going to be adversity. Most important thing is to stick with it. You know, always, always go back to the drawing board if necessary. Try it again until you ultimately succeed. The, the main takeaway from this, so my study time was around from 2010 to 15, so this was right around the end of my, my study time. So now we as the team sat together and thought, okay, we, you know, we're, we're a great team, we work well together, we're evidently able to achieve things that you know, other people you know, like to tease us would not be possible just a couple of years prior. So what do we do with this? What do, what do we, where do we take this? Um, so from, a, from an organizational perspective, we pretty much came to the conclusion, or pretty quickly came to the conclusion, that we wanted to start our own business around this kind of technology in one way or the other. And from a technology point of view, we pretty quickly came to the conclusion that building fi like five years of working up to a big rocket where you then push the button and see it fly, which is really awesome, but it's only, also only really like a 10-minute activity. And we kind of felt there was a bit of a mismatch between the degree of how awesome it was and the time of for how long it was that awesome. So we really um, started rethinking what we were going to do uh, next from a technology point of view. And this is where we uh, arrived at the idea of uh, rocket-powered space planes. So a few years later, after leaving there, we put together our first prototype, the so-called Mark I. It is a, an off-the-shelf airframe that we procured and outfitted with a small gas-powered uh, rocket engine that you see in the back, which we designed and built in-house. Uh, notably also 3D printed, so uh, that was a um, yeah, nice, nice parallel there as well. Um, and we flew this around and ultimately this prototype helped us kickstart um, Dawn Aerospace and really uh, double down on our idea of building a vehicle that can fly to space twice in a day, not just to you know, make everything, push the button and do it once and then in the end, it falls into the ocean, but really build something operational. Um, this follow-up vehicle that maybe also some of you have already seen, the Mark II Aurora, it's about five meters long, about two and a half meters in wingspan, is the, um, the latest iteration of this, and this one is actually sized for going to space twice in a day. Um, it'll be powered by a rocket engine that uh, I'll show you in a second. And so this is sort of right now our... Um, our next frontier, if you will, um, you know, much like on the previous slides, there was always like the next, the next big thing. Right now, this is the next big thing: going to space twice in a day. And I'll, I'll show you some videos of the tech that we have on this, and then I'll tie it together at the end. So first, there's a, a video of our um, rocket engine, which is also a bipropellant rocket engine, so very similar to um, the rocket engine that um, that Luca was talking about here at the the, the Firebolt. Um, has some differences running on hydrogen peroxide, so it's not cryogenic, and there's a bunch of other nuances. But by and large, um, the technology really is the, well, the correct one if you really want to go to space. Um, and this video, some of you may already have seen a few uh, weeks ago, we conducted our first flight tests of the Mark II Aurora. In this particular case, running on surrogate jet engines, so we're uh, demonstrating the, the systems of the vehicle. And once we have de-risked all of these technologies, the rocket engine that I just showed you will be mated to this aircraft to really boost it all the way to space.
So bringing this all together, why, why am I telling the story? Why am I here? What does this all have to do with each other? To me, this is all sort of a, uh, a similar flavor of the same story. You guys were working for one year on a, an epic project. And similarly, when I think back, we also at times were working for one year time at a similar, uh, at a, uh, on a challenging project. But what I really hope to leave you all with is that if you stick with it, if you, you know, set bigger goals, if you're not afraid to push the boundaries, keep building cool stuff, you know, keep doing things that other people might tell you, eh, maybe you should do something safer, maybe you should do something a little less daring, you know, maybe ignore them and do it anyway, and you will know where it leads, so thank you. Thank you so much, Davios. It's always very welcome. inspiring to, uh, to see how you were be able to uh, start from a student team within there and move, grow up all the way to be a successful company. So thank you. Thank you so much. We will now get back to Project Sparrow. Uh, we have already seen what the goals were for us this year, and Luca has explained to us somewhat how we can theoretically design and build an engine to achieve it. In practice, however, it is a bit b different. Parts break, designs fail, and apparently pandemics happen. Unexpected challenges are a part of every project and arguably the most interesting part of it. Let's ask two of our engineers, Nathaniel and Willem, how they experienced their first year at Project Sparrow and the challenges that came with it. So guys, let's start with an introduction. Nathaniel, what's your role on the team? Yeah, so this year I was the uh, chief of thrust vector and control. So I led the team working on the gimbal and the actuators and the control software behind that uh, this year. Yeah. Nice. And what's your role, uh, Willem? Uh, I was a full-time uh, combustion chamber and cooling engineer. Uh, so I worked on the chamber itself uh, and the cooling systems. Cool. We will talk, of course, today a little bit about your personal experiences in the first year of Project Sparrow and the challenges that came along with it. The biggest challenge <laughs> about which we've spoken quite a bit already this year is, of course, COVID. What does development of a rocket engine look like under COVID conditions? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, I think like most people here in the audience, uh, it was lots of Zoom calls, uh, Discord meetings, and what so on and so forth. Uh, especially in the beginning of the year when here in the Netherlands there was quite a severe second wave. Uh, and then we had to work fully online. But luckily, we were still in our design phase, so we could continue with our progress. Then around half of, in the middle of the year, uh, we started with uh, production, then we had small groups uh, machining the parts and, machining and, and assembling parts of the system. Uh, same for our first few tests, the ignition tests, uh, the cold flows, um, those were also done in small groups. And lastly, at the end of the year, uh, when we had our exciting hot fire campaigns, uh, we would set uh, with about 10 people uh, to go to the base, uh, and then, of course, everyone had to get tested and we had to wear masks all the time. Yeah, it was nice that we could at least end uh, with groups of 10. Do you have anything to add, uh, Nathaniel? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, uh, you know, there's the obvious difficulties of, like, being cooped up in a small dorm room and working there and only leaving when you go to buy food and then going back into the small dorm room and getting back on the computer and working on CAD work. Uh, but I re actually really enjoyed the year. Um, it was probably one of the more interesting ways to spend the year. Uh, for us, we still had like a lot of online activities and we made a lab that we could all log into so we had something to structure our days. Uh, but that kind of also led to the problem of at the end of the day where uh, you're working all day and then you like, you're just, just around the corner from your kitchen so you get your food and you bring it back to the computer and you just keep working. And it's, it was really hard to stop working at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple of <laughs> those nights myself as well. So that's a bit general about how the project went under Corona. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into the details. We started, of course, our project with a, with a design phase. How did we handle designing the rocket from home? I think Nathaniel can best answer that. Yeah, so really, you know, at that point, you have to embrace the situation. You can't change the world to, to have a lab that you can work in. Um, so really, in the beginning of the design process, our, the majority of our work was developing thermal models, developing structural models, and also uh, like creating 3D 3D models of all our, our, our system parts and developing our procedures. So the good news is uh, with like 
modern day computer aided design tools, you can do that all from home and you can do that all just on your laptop or your computer. So actually making everything was fairly easy. We utilized a lot of things like uh, you know, collaborative text editors as well. We found some nice websites to use uh, digital whiteboards. So we just had everything you could have like in your own lab space, but it was all digital and all online. Um, yeah, that, that's basically, basically it. Basically, <laughs> just fit. So technically, it was doable. Of course, there's more to a student team than just designing stuff. Uh, there's also a fun part. Uh, I think for a lot of us, it's drinking a beer after a hard, long day of work, which was, of course, not possible during Corona as well. Uh, I think, Willem, you worked in Funko. How did we kept keep up the morale during this time? Yeah, well, keeping up morale uh, when, when you were not able to see your colleagues in person, uh, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But I think we had our nice little cozy Discord server, uh, which where each department uh, had their own channel. So for example, uh, Jonathan and me, uh, we had our own combustion chamber and cooling voice channel, where we would be in the entire working day and would ch chat to each other and visit some other departments when we needed something from them. Uh, so that was really nice. Uh, and then, of course, we also had Funko. Uh, Funko was uh, this uh, committee uh, in Project Sparrow that organized uh, fun events uh, in the evenings from time to time. Uh, one example of such an event was this uh, pub quiz we organized for the entire society uh, and then about 80 people showed up uh, online in our Discord server and it was a blast and a, and a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I remember it as well. So designing it of course is fun, but what we really want to be doing is building it. How did the transition to the production period go? So that's probably really kind of where it got harder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I've heard someone say at some point hardware is hard. Uh, and especially when you don't have any lab space uh, to make hardware in. Uh, luckily, we had a, quite a few members from on our team who already had a pretty significant amount of practical experience. Uh, so a lot of us already had kn knew the basics of machining, and so at least we didn't have to do as many iterations on parts um, and learn how to do that. Uh, and also, luckily for us, there was uh, still, like the machine shops here in Delft were open in very limited capacities. So what we were able to do is really still produce the few parts that we needed to get started, and also then conduct some small tests here in Delft. Uh, as, as we continued with the small tests, you, of course, want to actually get to the big thing. And so for the bigger tests, it required uh, basically an insane amount of logistics because you have to plan out exactly who's going where and when uh, and make sure that that's all done safely. Uh, with the corona regulations and everything. So you then spend a ton of time logistically planning each of these like week-long test campaigns, and that yeah. was really challenging. Yes, that's a little bit the logistical part of it. Uh, I myself was mostly stuck at home because I wasn't doing much of production. I experienced it as quite chaotic because some of us were running around making things, uh, others like me stuck at home, and the team kind of fell apart in what they were doing all day. Did you also experience that? Yeah, I think, I think chaotic is the right word for that. Um, when we all started working on like production and making parts, uh, quickly all of a sudden our, our digital lab was empty, and uh, we didn't really have any processes of like, okay, well I see that guy over there working in the machine shop. So so suddenly we didn't know where anyone was anymore, and uh, like our weekly schedules fell apart. So we had to then re kind of think how how our weeks worked. Um, but it was still at the same time it was more difficult, but it became really motivating. Uh, too, because you started to see uh, test successes. You had hardware coming together. We had all these cold flows and like different tests we were doing. And so then we also set up like live streams, so you could everyone in the lab could in the in the lab online could watch uh, what the few people who are doing something in person could do. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I think all our team members that are here today as well will agree that the period February March the transition was really hard. But it wasn't all for nothing, of course, because we're moving closer and closer and closer to a test campaign. Um, most people in the audience probably won't know exactly how that goes down. Can you explain what a test campaign looks like to them? Yeah, so before, like, on a hot fire test campaign, you need to make sure everything's ready. So kind of the few weeks beforehand, we start cleaning all of our liquid oxygen components. Everything that uh, was taken apart needs to be thoroughly cleaned and put back together. We also, of course, just make sure all our systems are ready, so preparing cables, preparing everything like that. Then we pack it all into a van and a few cars and pack up all our tools and drive to our test site. Once we're there, we spend a day setting everything up. We scrub the floors, we scrub everything, set it up, test the electrical systems. Uh, and then day two is generally we test the system for leaks. We make sure it's all working as properly. 
Uh, on the first few test campaigns, day two, three, and four, we're testing for leaks and fixing things. Uh, but eventually, it only stayed one day. And then, uh, yeah, then you, once your system works and your uh, control systems work, your valves work, your data works, then you can actually move towards going tor towards your final test goals. So then you cool. attempt to hotfire. Yeah, so that's mostly the technical part of it. I've been to a couple of those test weeks myself, and they're always quite hectic. How is it actually like to run around there for a week? Well, if, if you like Tosties, they're a whole lot of fun, because that's the, the only thing we survive on uh, during those days. Uh, but jokes aside, um, it can be quite hectic. Uh, as you can imagine, there is quite a lot to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's so much to do, especially in the beginning. You start by setting up the system, uh, which is there's so much to do. You're, you're stressed, and you want to do it as quickly as possible so that you can go get to testing as quickly as possible. However, you can't be too quick about it because you want to be the system to be safe. So you really have to be focused and to do meticulously go around each step and make sure that, that the system in the end is safe. Then after the setup, you, you get to the most dreaded part of the, of the test campaign, the leak testing, uh, which can take quite a while and can really make or break your, uh, your test campaign because the system needs to be fully leak tight before you can even think about a uh, possible hot fire. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember <laughs> that when we were there, leak testing could take days and it's very long and it can be quite a bit uh, tedious. Why, why is it so hard? Uh, well, it, it is hard because there are so many possible places where there could be a leak. Um, and, and yes. Yeah. Um, so why is it that long and hard work then? Because it's also tiring. Of well, course. if you're in the crew that's doing the actual leak testing, uh, then it's really demanding because you have to m remain focused because of course you're working around this, this system that's r under really high pressures. For example, in our tanks, we reach a pressure up to 80 bar. Um, but when you're not on the crew, uh, there's not that much to do. However, in the end, when, when you get to a hot fire, uh, it really becomes all worth it. Because uh, even if it's just a flame out, like we had in, in June, uh, to see your engine firing up for the first time, it's uh, an incredible feeling. I think everyone is ecstatic. Uh, there's a magical atmosphere in the room. Uh, and it's just great. It, it's worth all the countless hours of leak testing, redesigning stuff, and so on. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember the feeling when something doesn't even have to be uh, an ignition, but something finally works out. It's, uh, it's very uh, empowering. So you also say we have 80 bar in the tanks. It's, it's tiring in long, long weeks. Um, testing a rocket engine, of course, is inherently not without its risk. Uh, Nefano, you're also a safety officer at there. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure we remain safety, remain safe during such a week? Yeah, so that really starts, uh, or at least for us it started, uh, as soon as we started our design process. In the very beginning of the year, uh, we started working on our risk maps and uh, understanding the system, understanding the technologies that we're using. Uh, we developed procedures and we uh, worked through mitigation strategies to keep the risks as low as possible. Uh, and then more practically speaking, uh, on a test week, you know, it kind of starts off with the basics. You make sure people are wearing safety shoes, so when they drop a wrench, they don't hurt their foot, uh, mm. or make sure they're wearing safety glasses, things like that. And uh, some really basic things people forget is like well rested and well fed. So we make sure there's plenty of tosties and uh, and yeah, have plenty of water around. Uh, apart from that, though, when the risks uh, become a little higher, we make sure no one's in the room, and we bring in safety officers who are not part of our project uh, to supervise our activities. Yeah, that was uh, often in the simple details. You say at the beginning you also design for safety, but more in the, in the risk maps. Do we also design our engine to be safe? Mm, yeah, yeah, of course. You always have to keep safety in mind when, while designing these systems. Yeah, and how, how does it look like to design for safety in that case? Well, one way to do it traditionally is with safety factors. So you use safety factors to account for uncertainties you have about certain aspects of the design. Now, an another interesting thing you can do with safety factors is uh, you tweak them, you artificially increase some, so that you can have a preferred failure mode. Now, this might be a bit complex, so I brought uh, a prop with me, our battleship <laughs> engine, and uh, let's pick two uh, possible failure modes that can happen with this engine. So, oh, this is the manifold, uh, the manifold should be here, like this, and then we have the nozzle on this side. Now, a possible thing that can happen is that the bolts at the nozzle connection fail, and our nozzle and the retainer ring, they shoot out. So then you're left with a, a nozzle-less engine attached to the truss bench. Another 
possible failure mode is a manifold uh, failure. So that the, the balls connecting the chamber to the manifold uh, fail, and then the entire chamber shoots off. Now, I think we can, we can all agree that uh, the former is preferable to the latter. So how do you go about, go about designing that you get uh, a nozzle shear out and no manifold shear out? So it's quite easy. You just make sure that this connection is stronger than over here. So in reality, you will have more bolts here than there. And then in terms of requirements, you will have a higher safety factor on this connection than on that connection. And that's just one of the ways we include safety in our, in, in our design process. Yeah, interesting how we can actually design for that. Well, thank you a lot, uh, Willem and Nathaniel, for sharing your personal stories. I think you now kind of have heard uh, what, a, what a test week is like. So I think it's more than time that you experience one for yourself. So beautiful, uh, the diamonds in the thing. We indeed had a successful hot fire of our battleship engine for two whole seconds. And it all looks very nice and easy, but let me tell you about the realities of actually getting to that point. As already mentioned in our uh, section on challenges, um, you heard that we had to do a lot of leak testing and it takes a lot of time. But in addition to this, uh, it took us a lot of taking the system apart, putting it back together, repairing the parts that broke while we took it apart, putting in new parts while we put it back together. Over and over again until it's, it was finally ready to put in the ethanol uh, and locks into our tanks. It also took two entire test campaigns before we were even ready to put anything in, in or near our tanks. Finally, we got to test campaign number three, which happened in June. And if you saw on social media, um, we did actually have a misfire uh, at this uh, engine test. This meant that we ended up with a lovely little flame out to the back of our engine, but it wasn't a successful hot fire. But what you didn't know, even though we were very happy in this moment, what you didn't know is that a day before this, we were all sat on the floor of the test cell thinking, how are we going to get this engine leaked, this system leaked tight so that we can finally continue to test? Of course, with perseverance and motivation to continue, we went for it, tried to fix as much as we can until it was finally leaked tight enough to continue. This was at the end of June, and uh, then we had to make a decision uh, what we were going to do next. Were we just going to sit back and relax, go on vacation and hand our project over to the uh, next team? Or were we going to see if we could try again? So what did we do? We decided to go and try again in August. That was last week. Uh, so last week we had our next attempt. And as you saw here, you saw the result um, of that uh, engine test campaign. This though, this happened on Wednesday. And our test campaign lasted an entire week until Friday. So the Monday and the Tuesday went very smoothly with all the preparations, 
um, and uh, all the system checks that we had to do. So on Wednesday, we were ready to go. But then we still had two days left, and we weren't just going to waste that time on nothing. Uh, so what we did was we, un we unpacked our lovely 3D printed version of the engine that we had cozy in a box, unpacked it, put it on a thrust bench, mounted it with all of the TVC uh, or the thrust vector control uh, components, including actuators and the gimbal, to see the entire system in its full glory. We also continued uh, to do a an attempt at a hot fire for this engine. Unfortunately, um, as uh, our friend from Dawn has also already explained, these engine tests don't always go as smoothly as we would like every single time. Uh, and we had a hard start, which meant that our engine test was a failure. On the bright side, we collected more data from this engine test than we ever had before at any other engine test. So we could use all this information uh, to improve the engine for next time. Because we all know that from our mistakes and our failures, we learn so much more than we do from our successes. Now, all of these engineers on the team, I would say, have definitely graduated to become uh, rocket scientists at this point. And uh, the best part is that most of us actually did it uh, from the comfort of our dorm rooms most of the year. Of course, this is not the end of Project Sparrow, and um, therefore it will still continue. There is a group of engineers ready to continue, and with that, uh, I would like to hand over to the new team manager of Project Sparrow, Nathaniel Stainhaus. Hey. Um, sorry, could you hear me? Okay. <laughs> After everything that we've seen today, I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room, or indeed anyone joining us online, just how impressive the efforts and achievements of this first time uh, team have been. But we are not stopping here. We are, um, sorry, our ambitions lie so much higher than what this team has already achieved this year. We are students who want to go to space and build the foundations of a rocket built by DARE that could one day reach orbit around planet Earth. So we will continue the development of the Firebolt engine next year and we will do so with the same spirit and determination that this team has before us. So, over the past summer, we have already spent a lot of time researching, learning, planning and debating on how to move this project forward. So let me now share our plans with you. First of all, our, proje our project, our goals have been broken down into three main points. Firstly, we will iterate upon and improve the engine's design using the large amounts of data and knowledge and experience that we've gathered through our extensive testing regime over the first year. Secondly, we will uh, expand those tests by incorporating longer burn times and the integration of the thrust vector control system. Thirdly, we would like to gather more data on the performance of our engine uh, and build a body of knowledge that will benefit not just future Sparrow engineers, but the Society of DARE as a whole. So what are our next steps in order to achieve these goals? First of all, we will be improving our data acquisitions efforts in order to gain more and more accurate data on the state of our system at all times, including temperatures and pressures during a hot fire. Then, we will be redesigning the valve box and the thrust bench and the combustion chamber using the knowledge that we've already gained. And we will be doing this in order to make our launch campaigns more efficient um, by, for example, improving um, the access to our engine to make them easier to maintain, to access, to make the whole process go smoother. This will also ensure us that we will get a more leak-tight system that will be easier to test on leak tightness by, for example, moving towards more standardized parts. And all of this will be working towards our next main goal, which is a full duration 40 second burn of our 3D printed combustion chamber that will validate our data, validate our models, and show us that the system can perform as designed at these high loads. We will also be working towards a cold flow actuation of the thrust vector control system to see how this system interacts with the rest of our engine. And finally, 
in order, as I said already, to work towards a dare-built liquid-fueled rocket that could one day make it to orbit around Earth. We will be working with more and more components that were designed to withstand the extremely high loads under a high-velocity rocket uh, flight, including the extreme temperatures and the immense forces. So with these goals in mind, we will now continue our journey from today on. So please, let me introduce to you the full-time team of Project Sparrow for 2021-2022. If you could please stand up. Thank you, Nathaniel. Let's take a step back. We started to get today with the goals of Project Sparrow. We moved on to Luca, telling us about how we can technically achieve them. After that, we took a little bit more of a practical look with two team members sharing their experience of the past year. And finally, of course, we could hear our engine roar for the first time. We have touched upon all the facets of a student team like Project Sparrow, except for one, you. I started this presentation with this slide, and I would like to end with it now as well. Because without your support, a project like this would have never been possible. Therefore, we consider our rocket engine to be as much your rocket engine as it is ours. Besides the helping us develop this rocket engine, you have also given 40 students the chance to develop themselves, chase their dream to be an actual rocket engineer, and give, gave them the most amazing year at TU Delft so far. For this, we are truly grateful. We hope to continue this wonderful relationship with you into the next year and the years to come, so that we may keep on pushing the boundaries of student rocket engineering. With that, let us finish by giving the entire Sparrow team and all of you a very big round of applause. Yeah, on the stage. If you could also get the presenters on stage once more. <laughs> they did a very good job. <laughs> and Tobias, of course. Yeah, social distance it a bit. Can you take a picture? Uh, sure. Nice. Of course, we will also be having a couple of drinks afterwards. That's where the, where the fun part begins. It will be seated down, unfortunately, due to the COVID conditions, and we have to keep one and a half meters of distance. Uh, however, you can get up and walk around to get a beer or change seats, uh, but wear a mouth mask when you do so. So we can all see you there in the, in the foyer in uh, a couple of minutes. Thank you.